wholesome cat game called Stray. We all know why we're here. Steampunk, futuristic kind of town. So as a new cat owner, I'm sure it's gonna be really moving. Stray is the most adorable indie game on the market right now. It's a mysterious, post-apocalyptic cyberpunk 3D puzzle platform where the puzzles are as ambient as the scenery in which the cat traverses. Exploration of the ruins, storytelling with actions, the sound design of the world, and the animations of the characters are all what makes Stray the almost perfect game I've ever played. It was made by Blue 12 Studio, a game studio in France. And honestly, this game is so close to perfect, I'm shocked. Blue 12 Studio also made... Wait, are you telling me this is their first game? From my research, they never made any other games. So for their first try to be this game, it's actually really impressive. Considering since this game has been worked on since 2015, according to their own blog on their website, meaning seven years of hard work only for their efforts to be rewarded is honestly just so freaking cool to see. Now, to get this out of the way, I have to mention that I am very much a cat person. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean I only like cats, and it's also not going to get in the way of my objectiveness, even though this game has a cat that's orange and I've wanted an orange cat for years now. So much so that thankfully the in-game cat you play as truly feels like an actual cat due to the actions you can do with this furry fella. Playing with other cats, vaulting onto objects from a distance, the cute idle animations, interacting with objects, automatically ducking under low spaces, sprinting, pushing things around by walking into them, jumping off a pile of books knocking stuff over, wearing a bag on your head, brushing up against objects, scratching walls, scratching carpets, and the most important ability of a cat. You literally have a dedicated meow button. I also love the user interface of the game, considering there really isn't any. It's very minimalistic, and for an atmospheric game like this, I think it works really well. The UI that is available is basically just an intro screen, which has a cat that moves and meows every once in a while, the loading screens, which has a cat purring very soothingly, and the cutscenes, which are usually used to help transition in between level segments in this game, and is so freaking seamless on occasion. Also, dying in this game is very sad. Don't do it. There are 12 levels or areas or segments to the game, whatever you want to call it. And each of these not only further the story, but have their own sort of vibes and creatures to interact with. In order to fully understand how good of a story this is and how it progresses over these 12 segments, I will not only talk in detail about each segment, but I have a friend to help me out in basically explaining to you why this game is beautiful. Not just visually, but with its linear storytelling abilities. One way it does that is by using the powers of atmosphere to make this game feel like an open world game. Almost like in the same way Sly Cooper is, which was a mission-based game where the hub world is basically just the world itself, but in this game, the world is open enough where it doesn't feel constraining whatsoever even though both games have a linear storyline. Now since most of you probably haven't played Sly Cooper since you're too busy watching TikTok and YouTube Shorts, not only did you miss one of my generation's greatest games, but at least you can make up for it by playing Stray, one of this generation's greatest games. Which is really funny because you'll never guess how I found this game, yeah that's right through Instagram Reels because cats love this game or hate this game, just depends on which video you watch. Wow, how ironic. The more I thought about this specific aspect of actual cats reacting in certain ways to this game made me wonder, why is this the case? Why do the cats react in this way? And I honestly think it is because of the development of this game and how they literally studied multiple cats to get the movements right for the cat in the game. Yes, we're going, yep, we're going down the development route. That's right. I honestly think that all we're gonna get is from this blog. And honestly, seeing the early builds of this game is very, interesting to see because they probably could have finished this game years ago but because of the polish that they wanted to do on the game they made the cat a lot more lifelike if we go to the hk dev blog the first thing we get is this art this standalone picture where this project was originally named project hk or hk project as we mentioned this was october 2015 but that same month we finally got cat movement as you can see it looks pretty darn good the lighting looks good and overall you'd think 
think that the game would be done by now, right? In 2015, but they only just started. They did some environment graphics and were searching for some more crew to add to the team to help with animation and gameplay programming. Then a few months later, we get this. I think you get the point. On the same day, on the 10th of January 2016, we get a new update. So it's a few months since the last update. They say, hey guys, it's been a long time since the last update, so here it is. We've been plenty busy on working on the cat behavior. This took us a lot of time because we had to learn how all the gameplay slash animation things work. I've spent a lot of time to have correct collision for the cat. Seeing that the character controller in Unreal 4 is mainly for biped, there was a lot to do to have the cat collided with the world without its head passing through walls or to have it walking on small surfaces without falling. It maybe seems easy, but for me, it was a real headache. So here's two quick videos showing some progression on the cat behavior. Keep in mind that it's really a work in progress. Again, it was in 2016. So we see the cat walking, pretty decent. You can see that the transition between the jump and the land is a bit wonky, but other than that, it's, it looks pretty good, right? For this being in 2016, you can see that the animation like weirdly resets when the cat lands in this specific work in progress. But other than that, it doesn't look half bad. Now this is the second work in progress, the air conditioning stairs. And this is funny how this one's kind of in 2D while the other one's in 3D, or at least from the perspective, that's what it looks like. About 16 days later, we get a new update. It's still very rough right now, but after a certain amount of iterations on the jump and fall detection, we've managed to have something that works well most of the time. Now we have a bunch of 3D mechanics here. Oh, we finally have logs instead of bricks or blocks. That's pretty cool, actually. So you see how it's starting to come together between the air conditioning, the blocks and the rods. So that's pretty cool to see. I always think it's very cool to look at the journey of how a game, you know, started. So seeing this in particular actually really interests me quite a lot. Two months later, there was a huge text post update. I'm not going to read all of it, but basically they had a quick Q&A segment about what platforms this game is going to be on, when the game is accessible, what kind of game it is, if it's inspired by a a certain walled city, if there's a newsletter, if there's a donate button, and where the crew is from. About a month later, we all we get is a screenshot of a cat looking at two robots, and I'm pretty sure this is the first reveal of the robots, unless there's a trailer in 2016, which I believe there is not. Two days later, we finally get the cat in motion next to these robots, and the one thing I've noticed is that the tail is just always up and it like barely moves, and this change is definitely made in the final product, but that's the only thing I'm seeing that can be changed. Plus, the cat looks a little stiff in this one. Again, this is the development process they're trying to make sure that the cat actually makes sense in the world. But this is obviously a rough build, and it doesn't look bad for a rough build. I'm just very glad that they didn't release the game in this state, because honestly, it would not be super impressive. It would still be cool, but I could tell some things would be wrong with it. Then we have another month later, we have the Alley Graphic Test. About a 12 second clip of a cat walking through a cyberpunk city with robots interacting with each other. And honestly, it doesn't look that different from the actual product. Although I'm pretty sure that this level is not in the actual game. We got another graphic test about a month later. So they're pretty good with the monthly updates. People have been following this for a while. Another alleyway shot. Again, I don't think this is in the game. Not that I remember anyways. So in April of 2017, the first update of 2017, this is a message from our CEO. Meow Mulao Miu. This means we are now funded. That's cute. And now they finally added the, the HK project early work in progress. That's the first labeling of that on a video. Now this post is very interesting because they have it both in English and I believe French. I'm not sure, don't quote me on that. But this was in December of 2017. It's finally time for us to communicate a bit with you who, thanks to the bottom of our hearts, show interest in our project. HK Project is more than ever under development. We took the necessary time to do things properly two years ago. It was only the two of us dreaming and prototyping this project in our apartment. We are thrilled to announce that since the funding, we have created our own company called Blue 12 Studio. So this is the official start of Blue 12 Studio then, officially I assume, and that we are now a team of five people working on this project in an actual office. So went from two people to five people at this point. HK Project working title is well underway. We still have a few years of development ahead of us, but it's definitely coming. Thank you so much for all your support that you keep giving us. Kula and Viv or Blue 12 team from now on. So this is the first ever evidence we see in June of 2019 that they study cats 
to make their game cat more realistic. Here's a message from our new <laughs> community manager, Oscar. We are not dead, just super focused on the game. We will post updates again when we feel we are ready. Thanks a lot for your heartwarming support, everybody. Then we got an update two years later. So there was a jump between 2019 and 2021. Now, why is that? Well, the only thing I could find between 2019 and 2021 regarding to Stray is the very first teaser trailer. So this reveal trailer was my first honest exposure to the game. And I was like freaking out when I first saw this trailer because I was like, I would love to play as a cat in a cyberpunk world. That's like one of my two favorite things. You got a cat, a furry, fuzzy cat, and then you got the electric electronic environment of a city and I love playing like cityscape kind of games you know so a cat roaming a city in a cyberpunk electronic kind of world I'm like dude this is my game I'm so down the original trailer got about 300,000 views on the publisher channel however if you look it up on the legit PlayStation trailer there's about 4 million views for the same trailer but because you know it's posted by PlayStation literally got the same thumbnail except for the PlayStation logo in the corner and then I guess some stuff at the end that they added for like the 10 seconds but no i was super freaked out when i first saw that update so now we'll jump to 2021 so basically in 2021 they had an important update saying hey people are uh scamming people with fake blue 12 studio emails uh just to let you know these are the official emails so if you get an email otherwise it's not us and then their final update on the game was in august of 2021 looking for a senior gameplay programmer in unreal engine 4. so that is the last of news of development so blue 12 studios don't have an official youtube channel they posted their trailers on the annapurna interactive which is their publisher for the game so yeah the developers really only kept their updates to their website and not really off that platform although i would really love to see behind the scenes of how this game was made because quite honestly i think it would be very entertaining to see i'd also like to mention that there's literally a minute 30 second video that is really the only behind the scenes content we get and it's just like one of those videos where it's just gameplay with text on screen where basically it's saying there was an orange cat in their game office that very much represented the cat in game um, so i'm sure this was the cat that they were actually studying to make the in-game cat look so good which makes sense that they would study an actual cat to really Really flesh out the details of the in-game cat which I find to be pretty cool so in this little behind the scenes video that's really all we get I hope we get more but it shows four cats that the developers have that were used as inspiration for the in-game cat in this video there's also some cute sayings of how oh this orange cat is known as the boss and is an inspiration where they found some of the cats this cat who was the reference for animating the main character Oscar had plenty of room to play around the studio so that way animators could study it and then copy it in the game and the two other cats were not only used for inspiration but i guess that the developers just had so they wanted to mention them in this video and all these cats were basically the models and the actors of the in-game cat funnily enough i don't think the in-game cat actually has a name it definitely deserves that title of one of the best storytelling experiences i've seen this year a game of the year at that one reason for my perceived game of the year status for this game is the soundtrack it's never in your face and most of the time you barely notice it unless there are tense situations because the music weaves its way in and out only really being used when necessary even though there's about two and a half hours of music according to the original soundtrack they blend together pretty well and help build the world i've always said that playing a game without audio is missing half the game and that's definitely true with stray since the music really helps you understand the feelings and vibes of each individual place. When it comes to game design, I always like to give credit where credit is due. So shout out to Jan van der Krusien for making the soundtrack of this entire game. It's not easy making two and a half hours of music. It's not easy making 29 songs, almost 30 songs on this OST. Wait, there's another disc? Hold on. Okay, so I was wrong. It's not 29 songs. 29 plus 41. This man made 70 songs for this masterpiece of a game. You wanna know how it's a masterpiece of a game? Because if you look up Stray, just out of the blue, the Steam reviews are a nine out of 10 and 98% 
of Google users like this video game. So no, it's not me just saying, oh, this game is the best ever. People actually agree with me as well, which is why it's blown up to the proportion that it has. And I honestly believe this is a combination of the platforming and the storytelling. In each of these areas, there will be times when you need to platform. While most people probably wouldn't consider this a platforming game, I'm very used to 3D platformers. Sly Cooper is technically a 3D platformer. KO is a 3D platformer which I was going to make a video about, but honestly, the new KO game is just okay, so if I were to make a video on that, I would do a retrospective on the entire series. Banjo and Kazooie is a 3D platformer, although I've never played it. Tie the Tasmanian Tiger is a 3D platformer, so honestly, it really wasn't a new concept to me. This gives way to the nature of gameplay in the sense of natural puzzles, which there's at least one per area, since you really can't progress the story without doing it. And no, it's not one of these situations where you have to find a certain amount of Picarots or whatever you call that in Professor Layton in order to, you know, progress the story. I always found those to be annoying, especially when I found the puzzles to be very difficult at times. But no, it's not one of those situations. It's more so just, hey, look around the area and see if you can find something to help you out. They aren't impossible puzzles where you have to think hard about it, more like environmental puzzles where the more you look around, the more you start to notice how to progress the story. This story in particular is beautiful, not only environmentally, but how well the story is generally told. It slowly progresses into something you don't expect and yet makes you happy that you even went on this journey in the first place, despite how disturbing it can be at times. It's hard to mention anything truly specific without spoilers, which is why we're getting close to that point, but just know that the game uses actions of a character to better tell the story, even though, surprisingly, there are dialogue boxes, which for a cat game I wasn't expecting, but it makes sense once you get to a critical point in the story where it makes sense why there are now dialogue dialogue boxes. Storytelling in general is always an interesting topic due to the fact that there are many ways to storytell, which is why for video games, every aspect of the visual and sometimes even the audible part of it can be used to better tell a story. You have the characters, the setting, the music, and the motive. This game has all of those and ties it in a way where you care about the characters. The settings play with your emotions. The music gives that perfect word of what kind of vibe is currently happening. And the motive is good, although simple it still gives you a reason to keep pushing forward, even when it gets difficult. We open the game with four cats roaming around this sewer valley until the pack gets separated and makes me want to cry. The injured cat then tries to find a way out. In all seriousness, this is a great way to start a game. It shows the brethren of the main character and introduces cat mechanics in a natural tutorial where all four cats are napping and walking towards a more hopeful place than a literal sewer. Sorry, Ninja Turtles. And I thought insurance salesmen were pushy. <laughs> A wholesome way to get us used to how the cat controls. This of course isn't the entire game because quite honestly that would be quite boring. Sure there's a market for innocent cat games that takes literally zero skill but instead of going down that route Blue 12 Studio decided to make a suspenseful masterpiece by letting the very first road bump of the journey to be the main cat losing grip and falling down an extremely worrying height away from his friends literally being a metaphor of loneliness. A dark pit. Rock bottom. MOOD! While kicking bottles, or if you're Freddy Dread, kicking rocks, trying to figure a way out, the cat spots a dead robot. This makes the player start questioning, how did the robot get here? Are there more robots? Is this what happens when robots and AI eventually take over? I bet this is Elon with a stupid Tesla AI! Eventually, you spot more and more robots who are scared of you. Fair enough, I'd be scared of me too. They lead you to an abandoned town, a great way to incentivize the player to investigate, where you can climb buildings like you're playing Assassin's Creed. Just a fun feature. While exploring, there are messages that keep lighting up to point you in the direction of where to go, which serves as a mystery in and of itself because that's totally normal. Following these directions leads you to using the world to your advantage to solve puzzles, which feels extremely natural and is the first example of the atmospheric puzzle, where you use items in your vicinity to help solve the problem, like using buckets as elevators. Honestly, a very genius move. Well done, Blue 12 Studios. It's also shown quite naturally, as if I haven't said that enough, that the cat can literally get scared, especially by a half-dead robot. Concerning. Or these weird round creatures that look like headcrabs. 
very concerning and is the first chase scene of the game this chase is where you definitely notice the music swells amplifying the density of the adrenaline pumping through your veins while you're trying to dodge every single little monster once the intensity has subsided i noticed that i could not only interact with the tvs when you meow which is a very mysterious effect but that the town is desolate yet you feel like you're being watched gee it's probably not because of the robots or the light messages or the head crabs Definitely not! Dead City is just a taste of the madness that's about to come. It's a very slow burn, but the patience is worth it. Well, that's ironic considering the situation that the person saying this is actually very extremely impatient. The flat is an immediate contrast to Dead City. This place feels warmer and safer than the outside. There's a computer where all you can do is walk all over your keyboard. There's a secret computer room where you can find a body. Wait, a what? Now the flat is one of the first sections that took me a while to find all of the power cubes for the computer. But now since there's another secret door where you can find a mini robot to turn on, you now have a droid companion. The droid's name is B12. Oh, why does that sound familiar to me? And this little guy is a lifesaver. You can use your companion to retrieve things that you can't reach. The cat now has a backpack to store his buddy, as well as an inventory. He's a flashlight. You can ask for hints. The more you search, the more memories you find for B12. You need B12 to talk to other robots in the slums, and it helps translate any writings. Wow, it's almost like it would be awful if we ever lost him, right? <laughs> Glad that's never gonna happen. Well, I do praise this game for being really great with its progression. Some of the puzzles can be a bit tricky, but thank God it's not Professor Layton puzzle tricky. Otherwise, I would be here all day and I would still probably be at the door trying to figure it out because I'm too stubborn to look up the answer. It took me a while to find the code to the store, searching literally everywhere for a specific number sequence, only to realize that it was literally only one room over, like next to the door. You don't understand. I was checking maps. I was checking posters on the wall with number sequences literally every single place I thought the code was wasn't there so not only did I go above and beyond trying to find this dumb code only to realize how dumb I actually was because the code was literally right next to the door when I swear this light was signifying that it was on this map but hey I overthink and I be big dumb sometimes so I feel like most of my puzzle complaints are merely at myself not the developers when the cat enters the slums, a robot sounds the alarm when he spots you, which means that everyone is terrified of a cat. With the proper context, these robots have really only seen monsters and maybe birds. So seeing a creature like this surely raises some sort of suspicion, especially when this cat is not nearly recognizable and is not a robot, unlike the inhabitants which are living in this underground society. Thankfully though, once the robot is convinced that the cat is not a threat, which didn't take a whole lot of convincing since the society members recognized the little droids that was with the cat, then obviously they spotted a fellow friend, leading them to turn off the alarms. Exploring the slums is pretty fun. This is our true first real interaction with the city, with its neon signs and members of mechanics, meaning that you not only can find items in this area, but you can give the robots items to help with the quests. While not all the items are necessary to get, as I found out later, like the freaking music sheets, the game rewards you for exploring with these little trinkets. Do these items actually have significance? against to the story? No, not really. I'm sure it's another way to extend gameplay if you are a completionist, but I'm not. So therefore, I didn't find it necessary to find all of the music sheets or find who wanted to buy my laundry detergent since everyone keeps spouting out that someone would pay a lot of money for it. Who? I don't know. Actually, later in the story, you do find out. You use it to trade to get another item that progresses the story, which is actually very nice that most of the items in this game are actually used to help you proceed forward instead of just filling up your inventory with pure garbage that you really don't even need. Unless we're talking about the music sheets, I, 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 I don't... I why? Meeting Momo just as well furthers the story, who is a robot the town says knows how to get out of here, and surprising him leads you on a quest to get his friend's notebook, four to be exact, which you have to collect. Why can't Momo do it himself? Actually, that's a good question. Why can't you just do it yourself instead of having me go on a fetch quest for you? Short answer, he big depresso. Fair. I've also had my share of days where I felt like I couldn't do anything because I was out of energy. Long answer. Momo is heartbroken because he is alone. He and his friends all had the hopes to escape, 
but failed. Now, they are well separated. Even though they are all in the same town still, like, bruh, just use Discord. He would, but his transceiver is broken. You then discover that the team took notes of their journey and ideas, hence the four notebooks, which we have to track down, since Momo over here is saying no no to the outside world after his dreams were crushed. Finding the four notebooks are pretty easy once you realize that all you need to look for is the common symbol of the crew. This also gives you the opportunity to actually explore the city if you haven't yet, especially the rooftops, where you can throw paint cans off the roof. Finding all of the notebooks and giving them to Momo, this gives him the motivation to fix the transceiver. Once this happens, you are then sent to the rooftops to turn on this giant tower to help Momo signal. This very red atmosphere leads itself to teaching you to use your meow as a distraction against enemies, which was taught in the previous chapter with the paint can falling off the roof. I love little things like this, where the game has already taught you before in a very subtle way that's not obvious, but once you realize, oh, the game taught me in a very subtle way, I can use it here in this different situation where the outcome is actually in my favor. If you explore the rooftops enough, you find a neon sign that is very much in dismay. You learn that the city used to be dark due to an energy cap on the city. But once someone started putting up neon signs, he was then taken away. A way for this game to use objects as not only memory key points, but which the robot then remembers, adding it to your Pokedex of memories. Go neon sign, I choose you! Neon sign! The rooftops also introduce a really cool momentum based puzzle with the same metal beam. But depending on where you jump on from, that momentum will then carry over to the beam. This is carried over from now on into different segments of the game. And I appreciate it quite a lot because it really makes you think critically of where the best jumping point is. It was actually my favorite out of the physics based puzzles, simply because I haven't seen it much in gaming. So this edition made me very intrigued. A more intriguing thing, however, was the longer you play this game, the more you see these alien like creatures slowly infesting the city with its unsettling carnage like goo that raises a lot of questions. Like, seriously, I thought this was a cute cat game, but now there's aliens? Or at least that's how it looks. Like, literal carnage from Spider Man. And Spider-Man is my favorite superhero, and Carnage is like, scary! This of course is paired with the fact that the music becomes a lot more eerie, making this whole scene very unsettling and makes me nervous! Nervousness didn't last forever though. Uh, is nervousness even a word? I don't care. Okay, because once you turn on the transceiver, it lights up the tower, revealing that the underground city was a shelter and that the stars are only lights of the domed roof to the city to protect them from the outside, which is where the cat originally came from, which means now we're under the dome. You know, like that one TV show that no one watched and it only had like three seasons with Hank Schrader. Wait, Hank Schrader's in this show? Well, now I gotta watch it. This is 102. Do you wanna play for us? It's okay. Now we back in action to the past where we once were, where we meet Momo at the bar. And don't worry, most likely there's no actual alcohol, it's probably just like motor oil, gas, I assume. I don't know, I didn't look that closely at the bottles, but trust me, these are robots. Why would robots drink alcohol? That doesn't make sense! Where he uses the transmission signal we put on the tower to contact Zabaltazar's Baltazar, I assume the Z is silent, I don't know, I'm not gonna fact check this, it's just a fictional name, whatever. To contact Baltazar on the other end, a dear old friend to Momo. It's then revealed that Doc, one of the notebook writers and Momo's friends, has a secret weapon in a secret lab to help get us through the sewer secretly, known as one of the most dangerous places, which, spoiler alert, yeah, it very much is. So after searching for 20 minutes trying to find Elliot, finding this door instead, and then trying to find a way in, which took way too long because I thought that this was the door, but after loading the game back up the next day, same problem. I finally found
found the right door. But it took way too long because I was so convinced that this was the right door, but it wasn't, even though it let me scratch the door, which is what I was supposed to do to the actual door, but apparently that's a very common thing in this game that you can just do without getting anything out of it besides a text box. Once we cured Elliot's coldness with the laundry detergent to get the wire, to get the poncho, to give to Elliot, see I told you that the detergent was helpful, we now get the fixed transmitter. Following this tracker leads us to a door to the outside, since Seamus, not Seamus, is afraid of not being able to run faster than the Zerks. We are now alone once again. You'll never guess what happens when we're alone. Yep, that's right, we escaped from more Zergs. Which, come to think about it, I don't think there was ever a single robot that had to deal with these Zergs. Yes, they really are smarter than me. Because now we're riding a cart down a hill. Very cool, but very dangerous because this is where the cat could get hurt. Trust me. This hurts me to watch. We then awake the doctor where he notices the badge Seamus got us. And yes, Doc is a reference to Back to the Future because as you can see here in the text box, it says 1.21 gigawatts. 1.21 gigawatts. Now having to use the fuse to turn on the generator so that way the Doc can charge his weapon. This weapon is super powerful and now the cat can use it, but it can overheat because of course you can't have an overpowered weapon without it overheating. That's just a common trope in these kind of sort of situations. So you gotta be careful how often you use it. You and the Doc are now together, helping each other, especially from the Zerks, to reunite the Doctor with his town, where this beautiful, wonderful, wholesome scene plays. town's confidence now boosted, we raft down the sewer. This place feels isolated. Probably because it is! You are now the companion to Momo as the lookout for any danger, and with the door being broken and only being able to be opened manually, we now return to solitude as we venture forth. Once I was alone, this is where I kept dying because there's nests literally everywhere and getting close to them sets them off. Like literally, this was one of the most challenging parts of the game. You can't sneak because then you die. You can't awaken all the Zerks because then you die. All you can do is hope that you can run fast enough to not set off all of the nests, which is basically impossible to do without setting off at least one. Go ahead, speedrunners, prove me wrong. You can't, especially with the eyes on the walls of the nest. Oh yeah, you also have those staring at you directly in the face, which yeah, of course they're creepy. It terrified me because I was expecting the eye to attack in some sort of way, which thankfully it doesn't because I already have to deal with enough Zerks as is. The game even puts salt in the wound by making you backtrack through the nests once you pull the lever because of course you have to pull both levers so yeah I died a lot of times and yeah it was sad nobody likes dead cats after toiling past my frustration annoyance and thankful I finally made it past the cat and droid were ambushed although it was a very epic scene that you could put epic music to the robot ended up saving the cat but now the robot is busted leading to such a seamless transition This chase in particular is probably the hardest chase of all, because not only do you have Zerks chasing you, but you have nests to avoid, dodging more Zerks from the sides, as well as the popped nests in front of you, all while the suspenseful music is blaring while the eyes are giving you the death stare. No, not the eyes! At least the camera wasn't facing the opposite way like it's a chase scene in Sonic or KO or another example here. Escaping from the chase, we saved the droid, but now our weapon is destroyed, making us feel weak against these creatures since we no longer have the upper hand. So not only did we just dodge literal death, but now instead of being rewarded, we get punished, making us feel powerless once again. If this game does one thing good, it's making you feel like the outside is against you, which is what the robots in the city have been trying to tell you this entire time. Maybe you should have listened to them. Oh, gosh, I love storytelling so much. 
We then find another robot named Baladin who motions us to Baltazar, Momo's friend. Ant Village is basically just a huge treehouse haven on the water, which is where the droid got overwhelmed with the core memory he learned, and he doesn't feel like talking right now. Well, fine, be moody, see if I care. This scene is genius because not only does it show a human side to the droid, since there's, oh, just a little fact that there's a human consciousness stuck inside this robot, which while in and of itself being a revolutionary moment in the story, since you saved a human or what's left of one, it makes you realize how accidentally reliant you've been to this droid, a friend, a useful companion, a weapon, a backpack, a hacker, literally the Swiss army knife of droids. But now, since he got moody, which fair enough, this is kind of like a life-changing moment for him, so sure, I'll give him space. It reveals just how codependent you are to this droid, considering it's literally saved your life countless times. Ah, I love this game! Anyways, this situation is one of five core memories, which are all achieved if you do the main storyline, which there's only one storyline, so you really don't have a choice. So if you go off the beaten path, you are rewarded with minor memories, which help flesh out the world a little bit better. Did I get all these minor memories? No because I'm not a completionist, though I am curious as to what happens if you get all of the memories. Leave it in the comments if you know. There's also another core memory in the train station where the human slash droid would ride it every day to work, leading to the fact that we have to find the other two friends. First, we need to find Clementine. Midtown is where Clementine is hiding, a Tokyo-like town, where we need to find the apartment with the address written on the back. But, uh... This is going to be harder than I thought. After finding her apartment, we have to help Clementine escape. While both of them are looking at a murder board like it's an episode of Always Sunny, Clementine states that the old subway could be the way out. Mmm, subway. But we need an atomic battery from a local corporation. But oh, of course, the same battery we need is the same battery powering an entire giant corporation. So they totally won't notice if we just steal it. So now we'll need a disguise, a ruse, which means that we'll have to steal it from two different stores. The hat was easy, because all I had to do was find a lazy worker and then hide in a box. The jacket, on the other hand, was going to be much more difficult to get. This mission left me stuck, because I thought I had to play a tape or a CD in this player, which I was supposed to do, but I couldn't find one anywhere. Anywhere. And I've been looking for like half an hour at this point. I literally found a different tape player in a barber shop. But nope, not it. I even found a tape necklace in the shop, but I can't even climb this, which means this isn't it either. While I am ashamed to admit this, and I rarely do this during reviews, I had to look up a walkthrough because either I'm too dumb to figure this out or there's a glitch. What? Oh my gosh, is it literally? No. How was I supposed to? Oh, um, I literally passed by these guys like 12 times. Are you joking? So it turns out, I'm an idiot. There's literally a guy with a boombox. You can not like that I looked it up, but in my defense, everyone else also seemed to be having trouble with this specific part, so I'm not alone in this. In order to get this tape, you have to do this by taking out all the security cameras. Three to be exact. Guess it pays to talk to everyone. When I played the music, I immediately Love the track. It sounded like a track on my new upcoming album. Very tempted to sample this and make a music video with it. Oh wait, I actually did that. After headbanging to this trap metal of a banger, we jump in the box and finally enter the corporation. Time for a stealth mission, dodging all the security cameras and doing a bunch of physics-based puzzles in this mix. Once this puzzle is complete and you take the battery, everything shuts off. Wow! Didn't see that one coming. And now the apartments are crawling with security. However, we can use the boxes as stealth like we're Solid Snake. Wait, did I already make that joke? Since we learned earlier that we can actually do that with the whole PTSD-inducing tape mission. all the security, we find a note from Clementine since she's not there, but because she's really into true crime, just like my wife, we have to figure out the secret message because the police definitely can't figure out these clues if they ever found this note. Decoding the message, it reads, find Clementine in the nightclub, where we have to get to the upper floor. Wait, is that Pyro? <laughs> Remember that guy that helped us earlier? 
So, Blazer betrayed us. You'll never guess why. Do you want to know what the even worse part is? Is the fact that I just now realized it took me this long to realize that this robot's name is Blazer because he's wearing a blazer. I'm done. No, I'm. Uh. Back in the sewers, there's not only more security cameras, but it's so weird not having the droid to translate, proving once again the symbolic relationship they have. Not sure where the droid is at the moment, but we found Clementine at least. Using the cat's small body, we got the keys, and now we found the droid. Finding B12 stuck in an electrified cage, and then rescuing him, we can now escape. I love the cooperation between the cat and Clementine, where if neither of us were here, the escape would be much harder. I mean, sure, the cat did most of the heavy lifting by dealing with the hard part, which is luring the turrets into the cells and not dying. It took a few tries, but it is possible. Difficult, but possible. Once escaping, we found a car with keys and left. Except Clementine chose to stay to help bide us some time, since she's such a nice friend. But also, now we're alone again. This game does that a lot, doesn't it? Although this is a very common trope in this game, it really helps give the world an image of isolation and ruin and gives us more time to appreciate how beautiful the structures of the world are. Like look, just look. Look how pretty everything looks. Inside the wall, dead city. Inside the flat, the slums, rooftops, slums again, dead end, sewers, ant village, midtown, and now the jail. Like all of this looks so good. For an indie game, this is like super impressive. I look at scenery like this and I'm like, how the frick is this not a AAA game? How is this an indie game? This is ridiculously, insanely cool. After using the subway keys and fixing the train, which is what the battery is for, you know, the one that we stole, which ended up shutting down an entire corporation, you know, that one, we rode off into the tunnel. We arrive at the station, and already, this is the cleanest place I've ever seen in this game. It's almost unsettling how good everything looks. This is Walled City 99, and it's the first time where you can't solely use the droid to open up secured doors, because you need a human to do so. Good thing our droid bestie has the soul of a human. Human. The door finally opens, but no one is here in the control room. At this point, all of the core memories are now unlocked. Since you now have all of the core memories, I guess now would be the time to actually talk about memories now, huh? You have five core memories, and each of these core memories are relevant to the storyline and are the ones that everybody will get just in general because you are going down this linear storyline. So there's no way to not get all of them, except if you don't finish the game. If you finish the game, get to the control room at least, you'll have all of the core memories. But the more I thought about the memories aspect of the game, the more I asked myself what would happen if you get all of the memories in the game. Sure, it's not something that I did personally, but I know a lot of people did it because they were curious as to what actually happens. And honestly, I'm kind of glad I didn't collect every single one of the sub memories, even though if I did collect all the memories, this video would be not only longer, but come out at a way later date than I wanted, even though this date is pretty late as is. But I did some research and what I found was if you get all 27 memories, this is what you get. I am so glad I didn't collect all 27 <laughs> memories. <laughs> if this is all you get, gosh, I'm so glad I didn't waste my time doing that. I also get that a lot of people like to just look around for stuff and find new hidden things. Some people are completionists. I am not one. I think I've said that like three times now. It's kind of cool, but I don't think it's worth that many plus hours to get every single memory. The ones that are important are the five core memories, which over time slowly show more of the storyline about what happened to this droid specifically. I'm sure you get some sort of achievement too. I mean, I would hope so at least. But yeah, memories are an interesting part of the game. I'm glad they added it to the game as to give more incentive to people, not only to continue the story to get all of the main clues, but if you want to be extra and collect all of the memories, just in general, just to say that you did it, go ahead, but I don't recommend it personally. But how can I not recommend something if I don't know the information that you actually get from the memories? See, the memories are important because you learn more about the world and it gives the world more context as to how we even got here in the first place. Will it answer the question of what happened to the society in the first place for us to even get here? Like, what happened to all the humans? And I know there's been some conspiracy videos here and there, but no, I'm not even gonna go down the conspiracy route because honestly, I'd rather take the facts of these specific memories and 
and dissect them to see what happened to the human race or how much does this robot know because I think the robot just knows more than we let on. And although I did say don't waste your time trying to find all the memories, I myself don't know all of the information that you get from finding all the memories. It's not just the cosmetic that you win, it's knowing about the world more because you put more time in. And I guess I just didn't put that much time in compared to somebody who got all of the memories. So I think now is probably the perfect time to talk about the world of Stray right before we get to the conclusion to give you more context about how good this game is. Like I said, there are 27 memories in total. First, we are going to go over the memories that I personally discovered, and then we're going to find the ones that I have not discovered yet because I feel like I don't have the full piece of the puzzle yet. So if you look at the chapters, because there are 12 chapters, there are no memories in one and two because you don't get the robot until chapter three, so that makes sense. I got one out of one memories from the flat. I got five out of seven memories from the slums all the memories in the rooftop. I got five out of seven memories from the slums part two. I got all but one memory from the dead end. I got no memories from the sewers. I got one memory from Ant Village. I got four out of seven memories in Midtown. All the memories in the jail, which was only one, and I got all the memories, which was one in the control room. I'm missing 11 memories. So I believe if I were to know about the rest of the memories, the 11 memories, if I will finally have the full picture of this game, and if I will be able to fully understand it. Because don't get me wrong, this is a beautiful game and the storytelling is amazing, but the true achievement for getting all the memories is truly learning about about the entirety of the world. All right, so first we are going to look at the core memories. The key phrase here is that the droid promised that he would go there. Promise two, he doesn't know. All right, memory two. The city was a shelter built by the humans to protect themselves from whatever was outside. But the cost from that is that nobody can go out of this dome. The outside was known as a disaster, a very dangerous and unlivable place. But the droid is hopeful because, well, the cat came from the outside, so hopefully things are better now. And finally, the droid's promise in this memory was that he would open the city, not just go outside. Memory 3. This was the revelation of during the ant village when the droid finally has the memory of being human. This droid assisted a human scientist because the other human was sick and he tried to help him out, uploading his consciousness to the computer. But of course, something went wrong with the upload, making him stuck for hundreds of years until we appeared and saved him. So there were two scientists. He was the one that walked into the machine. So the sick human is the droid. Okay, memory four. This main memory is basically saying how the droid had a family and the droid would ride the subway every single day and how his family wanted to see the outside. Walt City 99 and this control room was definitely a safe haven, but not everybody liked them because of the resources that they had when everybody else didn't have that much. While humanity was dying from a plague and did nothing to help out the cause, leading to tons of families dying, there was not much that they can do. But because of this tragic incident, this droid is now hopeful that they can still go to the outside together, carrying the memories of humanity and the people that the droid loves. Alright, so from those five memories, we can gather something pretty specific here. As of right now, I think the other person that wanted to go to the beach with the droid is the other scientist. The humans built this city in the first place. The sick human is not only the droid, but was stuck in the pod for hundreds of years until we helped save him. This droid, when he was human, used to take this train, and eventually over time, humanity got hit by a plague and everyone died. Side memory one. So Midtown is basically the middle class of this established society where humans divided themselves by social class even during hard times. And people from the slums were always dying to move up to Midtown because, you know, it's a nicer place to live. And since the robots saw this, the robots copy the behavior of the humans. Alright, memory three. Robots were copying humans even though robots can't eat. They still made soup. Why? Because that's what humans do. Alright, memory three. So this is a reminiscence of a video game that this droid used to play with the other scientists, but he can't remember the scientist's name. Memory 5. This establishes that humans were definitely the first to live in this established area, but that they don't exist anymore. And then the droid gets all existential asking if he will be at peace when he dies. Memory 7. So because of the human science, they found a way to make plants grow without use of the sun. And although robots don't need oxygen, they still took care of the plants anyways. Why? Well, that's because that's what humans did. Hey, 
So the city used to be bright and popular with these signs, but because of an energy cap in the slums, because, you know, the slums were not a very profitable part of the city, especially compared to Midtown, they eventually took down all of the neon signs. But then there was one guy who's like, you know what? No, I want neon signs back. But he got taken away by authorities. But after a time, people were inspired by this act and they started as well putting up their own neon signs, which because there were so many people doing it, there was nothing that the authorities could do at that point. Side memory nine, Neocorp. They were responsible for waste management. As trash from the upper levels overloaded the slums, they tried to develop a bacteria to dissolve it all. After the humans disappeared, that bacteria mutated. Gro Hold on, wait, what? So the giant corporation in Midtown are the cause for the Zerks because they tried to get rid of trash by creating a bacteria that eventually backfired once the humans were gone. That's interesting. Okay, I didn't know that. 10. So this is another example of society separating out between Midtown and the slums by use of a specific symbol and that they kept throwing their garbage down into the slums. Side memory 12. So this is the droids perception of what human cosplay is like, but specifically children just being goofy and then compares it to the doc missing Seamus in regards to loving them very much. Side memory 16. The droid recognizes some of these books in this collection, wondering if he's had any of these books specifically, remembering the smell of books and relating it to the feeling of comfort. Side memory 18. So this barbershop represents in which these robots love to hang out at. Just a place for friends to gather. Even when the humans were gone, the robots just kept going to the barbershop because it was fun for them. Alright, side memory 21. Reminiscent memory is about when this droid used to party when he was a human with his friends. Especially because underground living became more and more unstable. Especially with the giant corporation like Nico Corp and the Sentinels creating the police force. That's why they partied to get their mind off all the trouble. And this is the last final memory. What we don't really know is about the Sentinels. With my memories that I have so far, we know about the droid, the droid's lab partner, we know about humanity, that they died by a plague. We know that Nico Corp are responsible for the Zerks because it was bacteria gone wrong. We know that the robots followed the customs of the humans, but we still don't know about the Sentinels. Who are the Sentinels? All we know is that they created the police force. Are the Sentinels part of Nico Corp or are they different organizations overall? Because it sounds like they're different. All right, now since we've gone over all all of my memories we are going to go over the missing memories because as of right now we don't know much about the sentinels besides that they are a police state now memory two is a very interesting one and it's one i didn't get because you have to get all three energy cans for it so keeping the traditions of the humans as a sign of respect even though they're not there anymore all right so memory six is an art piece called human art so they've been inspired by humans and they're now creating their own art. So now the robots are taking their own pain and making art of it just like humans do. So side memory 11 was an ant village and is a dead robot. So the droid scientist body wanted a vacation. This connects with the very first memory of the scientist saying that he wants to go on a vacation with the human droid. Oh, that makes sense. So side memory 13 was found in the sewer. So they rationed out water supplies because they didn't have a lot. And the scientist had access to the water tanks or at least the blueprints of the water tanks. Side memory 14 is the giant zerk organism. Now this memory is very interesting because it's questioning the giant eyeballs in the first place. What are they? Are they zerks? Are they something else we don't know currently? That's something I'm still wondering. Side memory 15 was at Ant Village and it's graffiti on the wall. So the robot knows the language, which is why the robot can translate for us. That makes a lot of sense actually why this robot can do that. So this is side memory 17 and this is called Nice Spot. I mean, this kind of proves in and of itself that there's a human soul in this droid because this droid knows what being hungry, being tired, what a pillow feels like. This droid knows what feelings are like. 19 is in the burger shop. So now the robot can finally name a certain someone's first letter of their name, not an actual name yet. Side memory 20 is in Midtown. So the Sentinels were a separate faction that loved power so much that they started controlling people and basically just became the police force. So they're a totally separate entity than anybody else. 
Now we know that the Sentinels are a ruthless organization that will stop at nothing to keep the peace, or at least their definition of peace. After going through all of the memories, the reward is the memories themselves. I don't think the cosmetic really matters anymore, or the achievement. I think learning about this world makes it feel way more vast than I ever thought it was. And I guess taking the time to find all these memories can not only make you feel more accomplished, but now you have all the context for understanding the density of this game. I didn't think it was this dense, but there are different factions. There's different societal climates. We know where the humans went. The only thing we really don't know is what are the giant eyeballs? Obviously, they could be Zerks, and that's probably all they are. But just for that to be my only question after looking through all the memories, Honestly, I'm kind of amazed how deep they went with the lore of this game, and it makes me appreciate it a lot more than I did before, even though this is one of my favorite games of the year right now. Anyways, once you get to the control room, you have all the core memories, and our friend is hacking the security in the control room, but all of a sudden, the droid bursts and can't fly, finally revealing the droid's true motive. He knew that the drone body didn't have enough power to override the security without taking damage, saying how it could destroy his hardware. With the city now opening after so long, it eliminates all the monsters. You now have the choice to mourn the end of humanity for as long as you'd like. The city is open, and the sun shines not only on the secluded robots, but the cat's orange fur. All right, so that was a sob fest and a half. Let's relive this trauma with a bit more context, shall we? Throughout this entire game, once you find the droid, it's nonstop teamwork. In order to get into the control room, you need teamwork. In order to turn on the computers, shut off security, and opening the ceiling door, you need teamwork. Since this game has both of you being very cooperative with each other, it definitely hurts and makes you sad when you play all the way through the game to get to this point where your friend dies. But not just dies, sacrifices himself for you so that way he saves you and what's left of the city. It's a message of true love, sacrifice, friendship, companionship, and in general doing the right thing even if the cost is expensive. All right, now since we've gone through the entire game, it's time for the part where I give my general concerns and critical feedback about some issues I found. To be honest, these are super minor, since overall I could barely find a problem with the game. And no, you not being able to run the game because you don't have the proper computer specs is like trying to drive a car without an engine. Yeah, it works but it's not gonna work for long. I only have three real complaints for this game. One, how the frick are you expected to jam an entire bottle of laundry detergent in this small cat's backpack? This is literally the same logic as Skyrim. This one I honestly don't care about all that much. I just thought it was a funny observation, even though most games with an inventory literally have the same problem. Just look at Skyrim. There are a few glitches sometimes when you end up ducking under a certain object and it doesn't register 
register right in the game. This wasn't even all the time. In fact, most times when you crawl under something, there are no bugs whatsoever. But you know, nothing is ever perfect in our world, so seeing this singular bug through my entire playthrough didn't surprise me whatsoever. 3. The only real collectibles in the game are music sheets and energy drinks, which to me served no purpose because I couldn't find someone who played music, but the cans are used to trade in the store for other items, which is at least useful in some way. So either the music sheets are just a way to extend the gameplay by letting you explore the area more just to find an item that isn't really all that useful to you other than to say you did it, or it's actually useful in some capacity, although that was an answer I just couldn't find. I actually did some research on this and I actually found a guy in the slums who played guitar that you can actually hand your music sheets to. But once you turn in all the music sheets, there's really nothing else that happens. I guess it's just for an achievement. Other than those three things, I see absolutely nothing wrong with the game. I was wrong on some fronts because uh, I have more complaints than I thought I did. Not with the game specifically, but I made the bad decision of watching a honest review about this game, even though I've already talked about it for an hour, as you can see why it's such a beautiful game. This guy doesn't think so. Obviously, no hate or harassment at him, obviously. But there was a few things that he said. Actually, it was the entire video. They really grinded my gears, because that's a word because there's a lot that he forgot to mention and a lot that he wasn't fully understanding about the game and I just can't keep my mouth shut. Don't get me wrong, I love this guy's videos. I've been subbed to him for months and I love his editing style. But just because you have a good editing style doesn't mean your points are necessarily solid. I told myself that I wasn't gonna add more to this video. And now you get to suffer with me. The main issue with this game is that you cannot find an honest review of this game anywhere. People see Cute Cat, a cyberpunk world, and immediately it's gonna get infinite redded gold for the rest of its life. He can't find an honest review about this game whatsoever. Yeah, what about this video? <laughs> So you're saying just because it has a cat in a cyberpunk world, people are automatically going to like it. I mean, obviously, those are factors that people just like in general, like me. That's how I was hooked. But this game has way more to that, as you already know, that apparently he just doesn't know. Because in straight, if you take the cat out of this game, you're left with a drunk five out of seven at best. I also disagree with that, because if you replace the cat with another creature or even like a human, I think the story would still be as impactful. Sure, you would have to change some game mechanics, but I don't think much would change because the story isn't just about the cat. It's about the world and the world building that the cat is in. See, that's the issue here, because in Stray, playing as the cat has nothing to do with 80% of the stuff going on in this game. And you can tell all the reviews are just focusing on the 20 minutes of cute cat gameplay while conveniently ignoring everything else in the game. I heavily disagree. I think using the cat is a perfect representation of the juxtaposition of the world that the cat is in. The cat is a stranger, a stranger. So that you need that juxtaposition to really contrast the cat from the world that it's in, especially with the robots. Yeah, you can use whatever character you want to contrast as long as it's not a robot. I get that. But I think the cat was just the perfect choice for this game. The reason they are so intuitive is because the only controls you have in the game are turn, sprint, and meow. Hmm, it's almost like that's what a cat does, and that's what a cat basically can just do. Obviously, there's going to be basic mechanics to this game because it's a cat. You want the cat to control like a cat in the cat game that's about a cat in a cyberpunk world. Every other action in this game requires a specific button prompt in a specific area in order for you to carry out this action. You can't just do it whenever. He wants to uh, scratch everything and jump on everything. Why? That? Wh what's the point of that? To have the freedom to do that? Sure. But the problem is, if you implement it throughout the entire game, in the sense of like, you could jump anywhere instead of just vaulting on objects like how it is, then not only are you overdoing a move, if you could just vault onto literally anything, but it makes those jumping spots, those vaulting spots stand out to make gameplay more fun. If the cat meowed all the time, it would get annoying, right? 
That's why it's a dedicated button and the cat doesn't just meow whenever. Same concept. With this complaint also in mind, he basically wants this game to be an open world game, and it's not. It's a linear storytelling game. Obviously, you can explore and find different things, but if you had the freedom to literally, like, move wherever you want to, then not only are you losing that linear storyline and you're being stuck in one spot for way too long, losing the flow of the game, but also, do you really need to vault onto literally everything? I don't think you do. <laughs> it's not necessary. Stray is littered with all these small puzzles, and while they could have been great gameplay additions, they end up just feeling like padding to draw out the runtime. Now we're getting to the section about the puzzles. This is where I really uh, was heated <laughs> about what he said. In fact, so heated, I made a very long Snapchat rant that even prompted this section of the video in the first place. Do I want to do this? No, but I gotta, I gotta justice. I don't. Anyways. Okay, that's a solid idea, but they then proceed to use that same mechanic 10 times later. The puzzles are good for environmental storytelling. You know, you have a cat going through these trials, right? And although some of them are repetitive, I do admit that. I always saw it as like you do it the first time and then you learn and then you continue that onward, right? Yeah, it uses some similar mechanics, but it uses it in different ways. So you saying, oh, all the puzzles are the same isn't necessarily accurate. In fact, it's not accurate. You're arguing about, oh, I learned a thing so I can never use it ever again. What? <laughs> Why? Stray never gives you that aha moment or that feeling of satisfaction when you solve something complex. And right away, I feel like I'm doing the dishes again. So you want a different puzzle experience every single time? I mean, that would be cool, but it's not necessary for this game because this game isn't about the puzzles. This game isn't Professor Layton. <laughs> this game is about the story and the world building and the setting. That's what this game is about. It's not about the puzzles. The puzzles are a nice addition for gameplay and also, oh, I don't know, actually challenges you to think crazy. And while you see it as a roadblock, I see it as environmental storytelling, environmental puzzles. Those are kind of important to see the development of the character. No aha moments. Honestly, this point is very construed because I think it really just depends on the person. To be honest, I can admit there were a few puzzles that were hard, but honestly, that's fine. I'm fine with hard puzzles because it actually makes me stop and think and enjoy the game for longer. And I like that. Well, yes, there's the possibility of you getting stuck. I think that's fine for a game. Obviously, you could argue that the flow is broken, but puzzles always break flow. There's always something in a puzzle that you're just not getting until the last second. You're like, oh, I didn't look at it from that angle. The most laughable example of this is in one of the harder puzzles in the game, where you have to punch in a four digit code on a keypad. Through about two seconds of discovery, you'll probably notice the four big clocks hanging on the wall. And if that wasn't obvious enough for you, you find a clue that says only time will tell. <laughs> the robot just regurgitates it back to you while the big clocks are just behind him. You're complaining about investigation? Investigation. You just want one clue to solve a puzzle. Some people need more clues. Some people like talking to people to find clues. Some people like sleuthing around like Sherlock Holmes finding a clue. Everybody's different. So having all three of those mechanics of like looking, investigating, or talking, having all of those available to you is actually very nice of the developers. While you see it as a stupid thing that shouldn't have been a thing, some people enjoyed that. And when we're not being presented with brain busters like that last one, the remaining puzzles tend to fall into the category of thing is blocking your way, you have to remove thing from blocking your way, and then we're shown a cutscene of that yes indeed the thing is no longer blocking your way. Get ready for about a hundred of those. So you just want the gameplay to just be like no blockages whatsoever where you actually have to think about how to progress? That's kind of boring, right? <laughs> I like some form of challenge in my games. But in Stray, all you get is a jump and a few extra bag fries in the form of the occasional window blind to open and thing to knock over. So you want the cat to do more than be a cat. <laughs> you want more than a jump or a pull or a push. It's a freaking cat. If you want the cat to be a cat, then the cat has to do cat things. Wow, crazy. You can't just make the cat fly. Why? Because cats can't do that. There's even a moment where you get a CSI light that kills the blob things and okay, now we're getting somewhere, but nope, it just springs an oil leak and breaks 15 minutes later. The synopsis says you get this weapon, right? And you're using it and you feel powerful, right? 
But remember, robots told you that this place was dangerous, right? But you have to go there because of story reasons, right? Instead of the game rewarding you, the game punishes you for going where you're supposed to go because the robots warned you in the first place that this was dangerous. So now because your weapon is destroyed, now you really feel that terror of this place that the robots were trying to warn you about this entire time. But you didn't talk about that, did you? Majority of these puzzles are just repeats of prior puzzles. And whenever something new is introduced, it tends to very quickly overstay its welcome. That's fun. That's worn off by now, but still a cool idea. The same complaint about, oh, mechanics overstay their welcome. You like the vault in the game, right? You wanted more of the vault. Okay, well, instead of that, how about we introduce new things instead that you can also do? No, well, I'm bored of that too. How are you not bored of the vault, but you want more vault, but you don't want more box when there's more box? I don't, do you understand <laughs> what you're saying? You wanted more of this thing, but you didn't get it. You got more of this thing, but now you want less of it. <laughs> and again, the box is introduced every once in a while, obviously in the environment to remind you of like, yeah, you can use it if you want to. Some of the things like the boxes aren't even necessary. You can just run through and let the turrets find you. He doesn't mention that now, does he? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Do you understand why this video made me mad? <laughs> and also the box gets introduced so that way later in the story, you can even use it in the puzzles or to actually progress the story. There's multiple uses for this one thing, but of course you don't mention that. Just a symptom of a much larger issue, which is the gameplay doesn't evolve into anything. There's no upgrades or enhancements or items to vary up the experience. Well, duh, how are you gonna upgrade a cat? First of all, you can have the robot be the one that receives all the upgrades. And two, we're playing as a cat that can understand and complete side quests. Reality isn't the most important thing here. The reason that there isn't upgrades for the droid or the cat really besides the droid itself it's because that's not what the game is about the game is focused on the storytelling the world building the setting i feel like i've already said this but then this creates an even bigger issue where there's now no substantial reason for the player to explore the world mm, well that's not true is it the whole reason that you're in this place is because you fell down a hole that you now have to escape from that's the point of the game. That's the motivation. You escaping from this hole that you fell in. That's the motivation. That's why you're playing the game is to get to the end of it where you get out of this hole. Ugh. Obviously, that's not the only reason why you're playing it, but that helps give you motivation to be like, I wonder what happens at the end of the game. Hmm. I know we have to find these robots and I know we have to get to this place. And also, what's the motivation? Oh, I don't know. You're helping your friend? Just about every best game ever made has figured out that you need to lace your game world with trinkets and knickknacks to reward discovery. Otherwise, you're just gonna be sightseeing, which gets pretty old after 10 minutes. This guy wanted Stray to be Skyrim. Stray's not Skyrim. Ah. It's not the same. And in straight, half the time you're just gonna be met with invisible walls or searching for a necessary item for a very unnecessary feeling fetch quest. I mean, yeah, there are some invisible walls, but it's not like I was running into them every single second. I'm pretty sure you tried to find footage for this specific point because it's hard to find footage for this specific point. Uh, I've done that before, trust me. I honestly didn't have much trouble with invisible walls, to be honest. This feels like a very contrived point. Are optional things to discover in the form of memory fragments where this amnesia robot will temporarily remember what a beach or a train station looks like. And that's about as fun as it sounds. He says that the memories are optional. They are. But if you really want to understand this game, the memories are kind of important, as I've realized. But in an underwhelming reveal by Sir Same Day Delivery over here, it's explained that the Mecha Corp created the blobs to eat up all the trash, except oops, the blobs eat everything else too, including robots and cats. This could have been such a rewarding plot point hinted throughout environmental detail as the player pieces it together themselves, but sadly everything is told through us through monologues or excessively long dialogues. You do realize that there's not only Zerks that appear before this whole reveal, but that there's carnage everywhere sometimes in certain areas. And that's obviously where you would question this thing. So yes, there is environmental clues. It's not like it just happened out of nowhere or you figured it out right at the beginning. And the reason it's told in the way that it is is because without the droid, the cat couldn't understand anything that the robots were saying because of their dual relationship which is important in the story. Creepy eyeballs everywhere connected to the blob egg sacs, like it's some sort of hive mind observing us. Up until the point where the robot just explicitly says, Oh, it looks kind of like a hive mind. Thank you, Mr. Ubisoft. Really needed that one. In the entire game, you have this relationship of the droid telling you stuff, so it didn't seem all that, you know, 
harsh. Plus, you know, the droid actually has more insight than the cat, so obviously the droid would tell the cat if the droid knew something. That's kind of the whole point with the memories. Wow, crazy. The writers never explain why there's a hive mind with eyeballs watching us or even mention these things again for the rest of the video game. I mean, yeah, I guess that's the one part about Stray that I still don't know is uh, who, what are the giant eyeballs? It's a hive mind, they're Zerks, but what are they specific? We don't. That's the one part of Stray. I will admit that I just don't know. <laughs> but that's like the one thing that isn't really relevant to the story all that much, to be honest. It's like one of those secret bosses, you know? Well, he wanted more to be done with the hive mind. I don't think it's really necessary, to be honest. Because the whole point of the story isn't to kill the hive mind or beat the hive mind. It's to free the city and to escape. Killing the giant eyed hive mind zerk won't do anything with that. So that's why the game doesn't focus on it because it's not really that necessary. Instead, they choose to focus on the robot having this major epiphany that he is not just the scientist's assistant, but the scientist himself. Probably wondering who this scientist is. Yeah, you and me both. I have no, no f clue. Once I saw this, I was like, okay, they're gonna make this guy the scientist that worked at the big corporation to create the blob things. Nope. The scientist was one of the humans that got stuck in the pod. The last living human. Do I really have to explain this? The epiphany is important not only for the development of their relationship as the two characters, but it humanizes the droid even more than you would have ever thought would have happened. And it gives you more motivation to continue the story and help the last surviving human on the planet. Ugh, why doesn't he mention all this? Fighting the system, ending in this melodramatic go on without me scene, but a robot could have definitely in fact gone on with you had it just stood in front of the gate when he closed it instead of behind it. I, I don't get it. This is just contrived drama. Like this, this, this scene is so stupid. You know what? I'll give you this point. <laughs> we finally get to the big conclusion of the story. Just, I don't know. It feels like a cop out. How is it a cop out when the whole point of the cat being in the underworld, underground, whatever you want to call it, the slums, is because he fell down, and now, at the very end, his friend sacrifices himself, I cried, and then the cat is back from the underground. The cat escaped, and now the cat is looking for his friends. What do you mean that's not a good ending? <laughs> How is that a cop out? Because you wanted more hive mind. That's not necessary to the story and it probably shouldn't have been and I'm glad it wasn't. Imagine ending the game with this big boss fight where you have to kill this giant hive mind and not save a city. That That's kind of selfish, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. The whole thing reeks of indie developers had a cute idea for a game that wasn't really flushed out because it was a demo and Sony saw that and said, hey, we'll give you a ton of money, but you got to make a full game out of it and we're going to sell it for $30. And the indie devs are like, oh, shit, we don't really actually have much time to do that, but we got to try our best anyway. They've been working on this game since 2015. You can't say that. You didn't do the research. You didn't know. You can't say that. You can't say that. It's not true. Ah, facts and logic, am I right? <laughs> also, the team was slowly building since 2015. It wasn't just picked up by PlayStation. So if I were you, I just go on YouTube, watch some cute cat videos and save yourself 30 bucks. And I would say to you, play the game because it's got a good story. It's got a good environmental world building experience. The cat is adorable. There's a lot of reasons to play this game. So saying don't buy this game is very tragic. I I wouldn't I wouldn't advise that. I would say play the game. It's a good game. I love it. <laughs> it's great. And having a game to this scale as an indie developer is hard work. That that's my complaints with this video because it made me mad. <laughs> Stray was one of those experiences that you find on social media because people won't stop posting clips of their cats reacting to this game. Play it because, oh, look at the cute orange cat. After about 10 minutes, realize what the game is actually about. Get invested in the world, the natural puzzles, the mechanical characters, the music, and then finishing it off by crying over a dead friend who knows more about selflessness than anybody who I've ever known in real life. As you can tell, this game is about friendship about sacrifice, about how it's possible to get back on solid ground, even when you felt like you've hit rock bottom. I know we've all been there. When things don't go great or according to plan, trust me, I have three X's. <laughs> it's all right to feel lost or secluded, especially after the past two years we've had, but it's also important to have those meaningful people in your lives. Memories are key to life, whether good or bad. 
Because with memories, humanity can stay alive. I have some announcements on the channel Just Zeke hosting a new series called Translating Legend of Zelda and it is a hilarious dub series where we translate the Legend of Zelda show script a certain amount of times in each episode it increases the amount of times we translate it. It's a very collaborative project but it's hilarious and I also edit it but it goes up on the Just Zeke channel so we've been doing a lot of that lately. I also have been working on the dice game which if you didn't know I announced this I think eight months ago. But we are now in the final episode of the first season. Nine episodes that you can watch there. It's on iTunes, Spotify. It's on YouTube. Check out that podcast if you haven't yet. I also wanted to just say thank you to all of my patrons lately. Videos keep taking longer and longer because I want to make bigger and bigger projects. I still have a few ideas I haven't even done yet. I also have my album dropping in October for spooky season. So it's definitely going to be relevant to uh, Halloween. Become a patron if you would like to help out with increasing the budget of my videos or just generally supporting the channel i very much appreciate it thank you to all the patrons that do that already i think that's about it so thank you for watching and i will see you in the next video or you know click another video watch another indie game review you know <laughs>